we have come to the top Kelpie Palace on the most beautiful day imaginable. It's just covered in snow. How is this Istanbul, Ollie? I was expecting warm. It's amazing. I, th I think this is quite unusual for this time of year. Yeah, it's actually more wonderful than I was expecting. It is. We are about to go beyond a door that we would never have been allowed to enter in the past unless we had just been bought as slaves. We are going into the harem of the Topkapi Palace. This was famous throughout the world. It inflamed men's imaginations, the thought of these women, all for the Sultan, hidden away behind high walls. Calm down, the camera's shaking. <laughs> That's because you're holding it, Oliver. <laughs> I suspect the reality was somewhat different. It was probably a cross between a boarding school, a convent, and sexual slavery, which is a really, really weird mixture. But that is what we're going to go and discover. But of course, not everyone could come in. So there was a huge number of eunuchs, several hundred of them, who were responsible for ensuring that people didn't breach the walls and get in and sort of ravish the ladies inside. These were young slave boys who were sort of castrated before puberty. We walked straight into the area that was governed by the black eunuchs. The eunuchs came from Abyssinia. They were responsible for the managing of the Sultan's household, guarding the entrances and exits. We're in the Mosque of the Black Eunuchs. There are three magnificent painted panels onto tile, and they represent Mecca and Medina. These cities were al Haramain, the holy cities. Now you'll notice that al Haramain and Haram sound a little similar, and that's simply because they're both derived from the Arabic word Haram which just means a holy or sacred space that not everyone is allowed to enter. So harem doesn't mean some exotic place for half-naked women to loll around. It simply means that this is the Sultan's sacred space, his family home. Nobody else could enter it but him and his family. So when we think of the black eunuchs, we can think of people who are very, very subjugated and the lowest of the low in the harem. It's actually not true at all. The chief black eunuch, in fact, was the most powerful person in the whole palace after the Sultan and the Grand Vizier. You think of harems, you think of semi-clad women reclining by pools, eating grapes in the warmth. Definitely you think of warmth. You do think of warmth, don't Not you? Not snow and frozen <laughs> feet. Steffi, I know your feet are cold, but we have an awful lot of harem to see. This place is vast. 400 rooms, apparently. And don't worry, I don't think we can go through them all. At its peak, there were 2,000 people in the harem. And before men get too excited, that wasn't 2,000 ladies. There were about several hundred eunuchs. There were administrators, teachers, and so forth. But it was almost a city within a city. Crucially, the only men who were allowed in here who weren't castrated was the Sultan, the Sultan's children, and occasionally his brothers, but they were kind of hidden away in a prison. So this piece behind us is where the black eunuchs were. So you had to get through, through several hundred black eunuchs to be able to get into the harem. And what a beautiful gate it is. We are now going into this secret harem. This was the courtyard of the Sultan's wives and concubines. And this is what they would have experienced on a clear but snowy day in Istanbul. It would have been a bit chilly. It's funny, when we think of a harem, we kind of think of, well, I do, maybe it's just me, of the sort of orgiastic scenes. But actually, the whole place was very much driven by etiquette and so forth. Members of the harem were recruited. They were slave girls. They were recruited for their brilliant minds and, of course, for their beauty. Um, they were non-local girls because it was forbidden to enslave your local Islamic girls. But when these slaves came in here from all over Europe, so from, uh, I think, the Caucasians were the most popular, the blonde and doe-eyed, they would come in here uh, very young. The average age in the harem was actually only 17, which is quite something, isn't it? And they were educated. They were educated in the ways of Islam. They were converted to Islam. They were educated in the ways of the court. And they were also, of course, educated in the erotic arts as well, whatever those are, of course, I don't know. But this wasn't a place where, you know, the Sultan came in and it was a sort of big heaving mess of bodies. It was very, very much rule-based. So it wasn't like the paintings by Anglès? It certainly wasn't, no. Having said that, I think some Sultans stayed with only a very small number of ladies out of the hundreds in here. Others, though, I do think were a little bit naughty. So I know that one Sultan, he actually had over a hundred children. So I think they weren't all as well behaved as they could be. 
Where we've come through to now is called the apartment of the favourites. So there was a real pecking order in the harem. When the slave girls initially came in, they were just your standard odalisk. If a sultan decided to sleep with one of them, they would become an Iqbal. And as a result of them giving themselves to the sultan, of which they had no choice, by the way, they were given an apartment, they were given a cook and all sorts of things. If they went on to have a child with the sultan, they would become a kadeen and they'd get even more favours in a bigger apartment as well and even more splendid accommodation. So basically, pleasing the sultan came with real estate benefits. <laughs> the nicer the apartment you were going to have, the more you had to please him. In the 18th century, this wooden mansion behind me was built to house even more of them in the splendid style which they had earned. Not only did they get a fantastic apartment as a result of sleeping with the Sultan. They also got a maid and extra clothes and gifts as well. So there was an awful lot to go for it. Especially when it's not as though you can do anything else. There's no other hobbies you can have. Anything you wanted had to come through the favour of the Sultan. I mean, it is, joking aside, kind of tragic really, in, with a modern lens on it. This amazing room is the Hall of the Sultan. And we have to think of an evening here. You had the Sultan over there with his water pipe. You had his favourite ladies who were allowed to be sitting on cushions around him. But your normal lady of the harem, your odalisk, would have to stand. They were not allowed to sit in the presence of the sultan. We look at this and feel this is quite a formal place, but there was a lot of fun that went on in here as well. There was dancing, there was puppet shows. And at the end of the evening, the ladies that had done the best dancing for the sultan, there was a crystal that came down from the ceiling and they all had to jump up and get it. And the lady who managed to catch the crystal got given special presents by the Sultan. Isn't this exquisite, Stephanie? No, the tile work is breathtaking. It really it is. It was a world of beauty, even if it was one of seclusion. Absolutely amazing. And you have to think of it at the moment, we're all going around in Western dress, but at the time, that everyone was dressed up to the nines, wearing absolutely beautiful clothing as well. So it would have looked incredible. In fact, the women were not allowed to be seen by a sultan in the same outfit twice. That's a lot of clothes. <laughs> And just coming through from the great hall of the Sultan is his privy chamber. Now this is truly magnificent. The walls are covered in 16th century Iznik tiles. This was the absolute peak of manufacturing at Iznik. There are verses from the Holy Quran going all the way around the walls in white calligraphy against blue tiles. And he even had his own fountain and the sound of it just tinkling in the background is quite delightful. Inside the niches, they're inlaid with mother of pearl and tortoise shell, so they glint as well. And imagine by candlelight what it must have been like. There is a huge difference between this palace and palaces of the same period. Back in England, for example, the level of cleanliness was much much higher here. Whereas in a European palace, you might have had a tiny room that would have had a chamber pot in it, or perhaps a bath that would have been brought occasionally and filled. Here, entire suites of marbled rooms were simply for bathing. Look at this glorious sink. It's incredible. <laughs> I'm having a moment. This is, I just love the contrast between the gray of the marble and the gold. This is sumptuous. Absolutely stunning. It's actually quite rare to have pools like this, bathtubs like this, because back in the day, it was actually not thought appropriate to have still water, because that was viewed to be kind of dirty. So what people would have in a hammam is they had had flowing water and they would pour it on them. So when you see some of the paintings of the past, which show ladies lounging around in swimming pools, that just wouldn't have been the case. It was viewed not to be the right thing to do. There was a, literally an obsession with cleanliness. The, the ladies of the har harem were known for being having beautiful skin, for being incredibly clean. They weren't allowed a single hair on their entire body. They would have paste and they would pull it off and they were, had to be absolutely smooth all over. Were they allowed eyebrows? 
they were allowed eyebrows, Stephanie. Yes, thank you. And hair on the head as well. And eyelashes. Yes, okay, Good to all right. Know. Okay, so I got that slightly wrong, but you get my point. And here is the loo. Well, there were definitely no loos like this. This is very advanced. In Northern Europe at the time, there's the equivalent of a B-day for washing yourself right next to it. I've never seen you so enthusiastic about a loo before. I do like a good loo. If you think that was a rock star bathroom, this one is another level. This is actually the Sultan's bathroom. So he had it right next to his mum. <laughs> the typical hammam has three rooms. It has a, a cold outer room where people get changed and so forth, a warm room and then a hot room as well. But come and look at this. So that's the, exactly the same as the Roman baths. It's exactly, the same system. Exactly. Well, of course, and this used to be a Roman city. So I suspect probably quite a lot of sort of cost cultural fertilization went on. But look up here. These are called elephant eyes, these windows. Oh, letting light in. I love the little flowers yeah. painted under each one. Because even though we haven't got any outer walls here, it's still incredibly bright. And all this gold is really glistening. There's some serious bling. Come and look at this. Now that is the sort of tap you need, Oliver. <laughs> I, I do need one of those taps. Man of your station in society. You don't get those at B&Q. <laughs> <laughs> and look at this. <gasps> Seriously. What a bathroom. This is exquisite. This is the most beautiful bathroom I have ever seen in my life. That is some bath. So when the Sultan was bathing, he would come into this section here, which he could lock from the inside. So he had his own private space, free from intrusion. I wonder if he ever invited anyone to join him in there. Well, I don't know. That's not the type of thing I think about, Stephanie. Oh, yeah. So here are the harem kitchens. Now, let's just say I think that they invested a lot more in their bathrooms than their kitchens. I think that's because they weren't doing much of the cooking. Yeah, I just don't think this does it for me. I mean, it's a very disappointing kitchen. The kitchen may have been disappointing, but I bet you the food wasn't. And tonight, Oliver, I am taking you to a restaurant which serves Ottoman palace cuisine so that having seen all of these splendors, we can actually eat the food that they would be experiencing here. That's amazing. Are you paying? Oh, what? <laughs> uh, no, we, we've got a lot to discuss. <laughs> if the whole of the harem is a sanctuary. We are in the Sanctum Sanctorum. We are in the apartments of the most powerful woman of the harem, the Queen Mother, called the Valida Sultan. When her son became sultan, she would come to this apartment where she would rule everyone. And it's hard to imagine this happening in, say, the royal family in England today. But once a year, she had the great honour of presenting her son with a new slave that she would choose for her beauty and elegance and intelligence. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine your mother choosing you a new sex slave once a year, Oliver, but it's not. This apartment is, of course, sumptuous to reflect her high status. And it is, of course, no surprise that the most important woman was the mother of the Sultan. I'm sure that she's the one person that he had to listen to. Oh my word, look at this. In the snow, it's so beautiful. So the Sultan's mother didn't only have her own apartment, she had her own courtyard, of course. And you would insist upon it. I do think this was a really, Fabulous thing to be, the Sultan's mum. Yes, yes it really. is. She has a really cool bathroom. She has an amazing courtyard. I mean, there is a slight danger, you know, when your son dies of being sort of knifed and so forth, but. If the Sultan died, his wives and his mother would be escorted out of the palace to another one called the Palace of Tears. That's really sad. It doesn't sound very cheerful. This was a very exclusive prayer hall because it could only be used by the Sultan's mother, his daughters and his first wife. So 
if you made it in here, you knew you were absolutely top of harem society. But I imagine that becoming the Sultan's mother was not an easy path because the Sultanship did not pass from father to son. It went to whoever in the family took the throne next. It wasn't clear which of the brothers it would be. So it was actually rather dangerous to be one of the brothers of the Sultan. It was actually incredibly dangerous to be a brother of a Sultan in the Ottoman period. There was a process known as fratricide. So rather than have the danger of the rivalry of one of your brothers wanting to take over the Sultanship, there was this practice where essentially you would murder your brothers. It was almost state-sanctioned murder. The worst one ever was Mehmed III, who actually murdered 19 of his brothers and half-brothers, including drowning seven pregnant women. Absolutely horrific. In fact, it caused so much repulsion in the 1600s that the following Sultan, the Sultan Ahmed I, decided he was going to have a new process. So instead of killing the brothers, they were actually kept in a prison in the harem called the Golden Cage which sounds absolutely wonderful, you're in a harem, but actually they were completely cut off from the outside world. Many of them went absolutely mad. So not a great place to be. They created entire lives for themselves within the prison. One, when told that he was Sultan, had just spent the last several years of his life devoting himself to calligraphy. And after becoming Sultan, often said that he just wanted to go back to the way things were before. Another one was so terrified for his life that when he was told that he was Sultan, he refused to come out of the prison until someone presented his brother's dead body to him so he could be sure he wasn't being tricked. And it created several generations of Sultans who were not truly fit to rule because they had never left the harem. They knew nothing of the country that they were suddenly told they were in charge of. And increasingly, it wasn't just the women who were kept inside the harem, but the Sultan and his brothers as well. Yeah. From the 1600s, the entire court would basically just stay here and only occasionally go out. So became cut off from the entire world. And that's probably one reason why gradually over the time, the Ottoman Empire kind of got behind the rest of the world too, because they just weren't part of it. They were ruling from this closeted place. The rest of the world was catching up with new technology and so forth. So eventually, over hundreds of years, the Ottoman Empire went into a very, very slow decline. But over time, the Sultan started to realise that they were falling behind a little with modern trends, as other people would come and visit the city. And they wanted to show that they could also have modern palaces like other global leaders. So they decided to venture out of the palace and they built a new palace. And that's where we're going now to see the modern harem. All right, I like the sound of that. So this is quite an entrance. Yeah, this is the way to come and go. Yeah, isn't you it? come by boat. Yeah, none of these taxis. So here we are, we've left the Top Cafe Palace and we are now at the Sultan's new pad, the Dolmabachi Palace. Now this shows the complete Western influence that the Sultan's had at the time. This has got Baroque, Rococo and so forth. This is enormous. This is 45,000 square meters. Which makes it over 43,000 square metres bigger than the Chateau de la Lande. Yeah. I, and I don't live in a small house, but... <laughs> it's insanely large. What is this? Insanely large. 285 rooms. This was built between 1843 and 1856 and cost $2 billion. In today's, today's money? money. Oh yeah. my goodness. So quite some pad. I'm actually very partial to that swan fountain. I'm wondering whether we should upgrade the Lalonde fountain. Definitely. I love this, seeing the flowers just coming up through the snow. Ooh. So beautiful. Oh God, Steph. What have you done? What have you... I turn away for five seconds. Look at this. Did that just happen to you? Pristine palace. I... And I just trod in the only bit of mud and the whole palace. This is, this is what happens at home when I take Coco for a walk and I come home and I get into real trouble. This is basically what our city room looks like. I see why Camilla thought we should start this channel. I'm basically a babysitter so she can get some rest. <laughs> I think so. We've been walking for absolutely ages to find the entrance to the harem and 
Well, it's right round the back. <laughs> and it's getting bigger and bigger. The palace has entirely changed colour. It's still the same palace. Look at it. We're still nowhere near the end. We just can't find the harem. It's a very 21st century problem. <laughs> Been the bane of your life. Absolutely, I've been looking for this harem for ages. We've just worked it out. The entire pink bit that we were walking past that joins over to the main palace there is the harem. It's all the women's area. The this is a pit. mega harem. It really mega. is. No, I'm sorry, Oliver, but I don't want to be in the pink bit. I want to be in the main bit. It is rather nice. Has to say, it is a little bit more grand. Yeah, it's better. I don't think you get in there, Stephanie, unless you had basically sex change. <laughs> well, you know, for a palace. Could be worth it. I think she probably would actually Could for a work. palace. I would consider it. I can't really describe the emotions I have. I think I'm just genuinely really sad. So each of these is an apartment for one of the Sultan's wives. And they are, you know, very nice, but essentially they're one or two bedroom apartments next to each other. It feels really like an institution. And what's so shocking about it is it just feels so modern. There's very grand halls, but it does feel like you are in a really, really nice prison. I think it's hit both of us very hard, actually. Uh, it, it was quite depressing and it's odd to feel that feeling of oppression amid such luxury. I think it's the fact that it's so close to our own age and so relatable. So everything feels like it only just happened. Why it feels so different from a palace like Versailles when actually the sense is fairly similar. The palace belongs to the king and within it his mistresses or wives have apartments. The reason there's such a different feel is that at Versailles they were just their apartments in his royal palace but these women had entire chateaus in their own right that they were free to travel to when they wanted. They had freedom and a certain amount of choice, not the amount of choice we have today, but a certain amount of choice in their life. And they were extremely wealthy women in their own right. The women here were also very, very wealthy. They spent most of their time shopping for chandeliers, it seems, because they would outdo themselves with buying yet more elaborate, expensive chandeliers for the Sultan's main palace. This has one of the best chandelier collections ever. It does. Uh, if you want to look at chandeliers, this is the place to come. They ordered chandeliers from all over Europe, from Italy, from Czechoslovakia, and they are magnificent. But that was their only way of expressing themselves. It was basically catalogue shopping uh, all day long. So we've come out of the Dolma Vache Palace and we have found the best spot ever. The snow is gone, the sun is out, I can feel the warmth on my skin and the water is just glistening, look at that. But I don't know about you Stephanie, I've got, I've got slightly mixed feelings having seen the palaces and the harems today. I feel exactly the same way because when we're in the Top Kapi Palace, it's very ancient architecture. You can see that you're in a place that's 500 or so years old. And so it feels like the very distant past when everything was different anyway. But coming to the Doma Bache Palace and seeing these effectively Victorian rooms and realizing that women were still living in that way then is quite moving because- Right up to the earliest 20th century. Yes, and so you can't help but put yourself into that situation. There's even photographs. As things got a little bit more relaxed in the early 20th century, the women of the harem here were actually allowed out in carriages to go on little day tours. They were still heavily guarded. Just to see a photo makes you realize this is not a long time ago. Yeah. Every fiber of my being just fights against this thought because for me it would be my worst nightmare. I'm somebody who's fought for personal independence always. I appreciate the freedom in my life so much, my freedom to travel alone if I wish as a woman, to make my own decisions, to forge my own path is so critical to me. But at the same time, thinking back 500 years, we're talking about a time when there was almost no social mobility and yet the Topkapi Palace was a place where a slave girl 
could and regularly did become Valida Sultan, the highest female position in the land. But the problem is that they didn't have a choice in following that path. There can be this sort of lens that these were entirely subjugated women um, there for the whim of the Sultan. The reality is that the women in the harem, they did have a huge amount of political power as well. In fact, there's a whole period from the late 1500s to the 1600s called the reign of women, simply because behind the scenes, the, the women of the harem were exercised enormous influence, particularly when the sultans at the time were either young or sort of mentally not entirely with it. It's such a dichotomy, extraordinary political power and zero personal freedom. Exactly. I mean, I would keep the personal freedom yeah. and then they can have the political power, frankly. And I think the other thing, because you've got so much sort of at stake with the power there, there was quite a lot of anxiety about who was in with the Sultan and who wasn't. And there are examples of concubines throwing each other off cliffs or strangling each other or drowning and so forth, just to make sure that they were staying with the Sultan when others weren't, which I kind of think sounds awful, but at the same time, it's probably entirely expected when you've got such a closed world with such pressure and at stake. And it was an incredibly cruel place, not just for the women, but also for the, for the men there as well. It talks about the golden cage. This is the Sultan's brothers who were kept in the, in the golden cage that they weren't a threat to power. The eunuchs who were guarding them had their ears perforated and their tongue split so that they wouldn't say or hear anything that was going on. It was just so shocking now. We, we just cannot imagine. And the tragedy for us, these many centuries later, is that the women were not leaving any records of their existence. Nobody was writing their stories. They were recording events in the harem, and we have those records, but there were no paintings. And that's because under Islam, it was considered unholy to depict paintings of faces. Figurative paintings weren't really allowed. And on top of that, male artists were not allowed into the harem, so couldn't paint anything. And the images that we get from Western artists at the time imagining the harem are almost certainly extremely different from the reality. There was a diplomat's wife who in the mid 19th century when traveling with her husband on his diplomatic missions in Turkey was allowed to go into a harem in Constantinople and was able to paint the women there. And if you look at her paintings, they are very, very different from the rather overactive imagination of the Western male artists' paintings, uh, because they, of course, didn't get to see the actual reality. Yes, I think some of them get rather carried away. They got a bit carried away, didn't they? They really <laughs> did. But, of course, what we want to do is go back in time and actually speak to the women there and hear from them what life was like. But actually, I have incredible admiration for women who against their will entirely were thrown into this world and yet fought for themselves and managed to rise to the top of that. One of them is believed to have been the cousin of Josephine Bonaparte. She was called Aimée de Rivery. She, like Josephine, grew up on the island of Martinique and she was being sent back to Paris to attend convent school when her boat was captured by pirates and she was sold into slavery and given to the then Sultan. Unbelievably, she really managed to make the most of her situation. She ingratiated herself to the Sultan, eventually becoming his favorite, and her son became Mahmud II. And under his reign, she was, of course, Valida Sultan, the highest position in the harem. And under her influence, things became a little bit more open. And by a little bit more open, I mean that they were able to leave, heavily guarded, to go on picnics, to go and see the waters of the Bosphorus. So influence definitely started to come in from the West through the women that were being captured, because, of course, they were the only ones coming in from outside. These women had more power than perhaps they themselves realised. I've come from the sunshine of Spain. <laughs> Hey, come to warm Istanbul, I said. Yeah, it was Join funny. me. Tropical weather. I think we just hadn't quite clocked how the weather worked here. We thought we were going to come for some sort of winter heat. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I have promised though there'll be amazing food because we're not going to what I suspect is an extremely good kebab house behind you. We're going to quite a swanky restaurant to try Ottoman specialities. Yes, and th this apparently was meals that were cooked in Ottoman palaces, so I think very, very fitting. I'm trying to protect my car because my hair is so straight that one second in the snow or the rain is going to just pull out every wave. Oh, it's being a woman. Oh, now that looks very, very welcome to come in from the cold. <laughs> you look freezing, Ollie. 
500-year-old palace cuisine and dishes of the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. That'll do. Now, this looks like a man who is serious about his food. I think we can trust him. To a perfect Ottoman palace meal. Yes, absolutely, after a perfect Ottoman palace day. Well, I'm hoping that we're going to discover what they actually ate inside the harem, because I'm sure the women had the best of food. We got here Sultan's a menu appetizer, cold and hot appetizer together. Baba Ganoush, a cheese pie, four different types of cheese, raisin, pistachio, and on the top is honey, dried eggplant, stuff it with the mincemeat, rice, and yogurt. This is heaven in a bite, and I know because whilst you were eating that, I was getting on with this. You are you are the master chef of some of these creations. Yes, I am master yes. chef and I'm um, an owner also. Oh really? Wow. Yes. And uh, I'm a little expert about Ottoman Sultan's cuisine. Right. Yes. The people cooking in Turkey, in Istanbul, fish kebab, fish kebab, again fish kebab. I'm thinking what sultans was eat when 15th century, 16th century, 13th century. I just trying to find and I didn't see anything. So I open archives, yeah. I just check 15th century cookbooks and I just calculate wow. what, what they have. Yes. Yeah, what they have on the book from 15th century, what they have on the archives from the sultans. Palace. We visited the harem in the top cafe palace. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is the sort of food that would have been served there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Ottoman culture, they didn't eat like um, normal service. Everything is on the middle, they eat there. Also, uh, for the Sultan, Sultan eat alone. Nobody cannot eat with him. Ah, oh, that's yes. I like yes. that. I like yes. that. I bet you do, you're unsociable. Yeah. <laughs> on social yeah. Yeah. Yeah, our main course. There is a trio platter. This one is goose. This one is neck of lamb. This one is stuffed apple. Wow, it is sour that. apple. Inside there is the ground uh, mincemeat, the uh, beef, and then there is molasses, rice, onion, some secretly ingredients which we don't tell you. Good ingredients. Yes. We won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> After. The, the smells coming from here are incredible. Wow. Yes. Thank you very much. What's the matter, Oliver? You're having a freak out. I can't remember which order he said I had to eat this meal in, so I'm slightly, I'm like, I'm getting, I'm getting anxiety over my It's a miracle order. to me that you ever passed any exams at university. <laughs> Goose first. Okay. Then apple. Then apple. Then lamb. <laughs> How is the goose, Ollie? It's not going to last long. <laughs> it's really, really, really good. I'm feeling emotional about the goose. I've only ever cooked goose at Christmas, and I always find it tasty, but very, very dry. And this isn't dry at all. It's like duck, only much, much better. And I have never experienced this before. It's worth coming for this dish alone. Obviously, no meal is complete without dressing all the up as a sultan. That goes without saying. I'm the uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. <laughs> oh, are you the Magnificent? You yeah. call yourself the Magnificent. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm thinking of introducing that title in the house when I get home with my girls. What do you think? Pretty magnificent, actually. Who are you exactly? The Demure. The Demure? Yes, I'm the Demure. See? Oh, I like.